and uh, among 100 countries around the world. And there are like 250 entries. So the, the Imperial Homes was one of the nominee for low carbon urban transformation category. You know, the buyer sees everything's working from the solar and the lithium battery. So actually this is their contribution to the Philippines and we're very happy that a lot of developers are now getting interested in it. We would like to shoot the, our goal to make the Philippines the solar capital of Asia and I think we're getting recognized globally because you know we're, the company is getting this kind of nomination and um, it's working. It's working and um, including the lithium battery, it's working. Thank you very much. Dion, we've heard from Emma and Matthias. Do you have some uh, some things you want to share, some uh, experience of residential rooftop around the world? I think uh, we were talking about Bangladesh earlier and the success there. Yeah, um, I think the potential is huge, um, particularly when I benchmark it with a country that I've been spending a lot of time in recently. Uh, I've been uh, uh, in Bangladesh, and I don't know whether you're aware of that, but Bangladesh is the world's country with the highest number of solar home systems. Guess how many solar home systems they have installed in Bangladesh? Anyone? How much? 100,000? 1 million? Uh, the figure that I've been given the latest, but people are not 100% sure whether it's correct, some say it might be more, some say it might be less, 4 million solar home systems. But these are different than what you've seen on uh, Emma's houses. Uh, the solar home systems in Bangladesh are mainly for remote off-grid communities or communities where the reliability of the grid is so shaky that people still want to have a small scale solar home systems. And these systems are designed to be so affordable that the rates that people pay are more or less in line with the uh, fuel that they otherwise would be, or the kerosene lamps that they've been using. Uh, so these are systems that are 20 watt, 30 watt, 40 watt, uh, and these are DC systems. They don't have an inverter. The inverter costs extra money to connect everything to an AC system. There's a huge industry in Bangladesh, it's all DC based. You could import a 20 watt panel with a, a lead acid battery and a couple of uh, uh, LED lamps, maybe with a fan. I've seen DC fans in Bangladesh that only consume 6 watt. So what they actually connect to the system has minimal electricity uh, requirements. You can import uh, a small DC system 20 watt for 100 US dollars. A 200 uh, uh, um, US dollar will give you uh, a 40 watt uh, with battery, with uh, a fan and a small television set. And the small television set is a 10 watt DC television. So I think this is totally untapped in the Philippines. I asked the same question in Indonesia because it hasn't happened in Indonesia yet, even though there are 100 million people uh, off grid in Indonesia. Uh, I don't know how many off grid there are in the Philippines. You'd be surprised we've sold 6,000 solar home systems in the Philippines. In my country. In in the and then there's other companies that have also sold many thousands of solar homes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is good news, uh, and I guess in total maybe we've got 50 or 100,000 systems in the Philippines, but benchmarking that with 4 million, there is still a huge market opportunity. Absolutely. And I think the uh, critical success factor in Bangladesh has been microfinancing, systems that are uh, scaled to a level where they become affordable and uh, uh, a network of support both in terms of, you know, oh, maybe the cable uh, uh, is not properly connected to the battery, there's a problem somewhere, 
and there is somebody there that can fix it. I've heard stories from remote locations in Malaysia where most of these systems didn't work because that support wasn't available and nobody locally knew how to fix it. So Bangladesh has actually created a lot of local domestic jobs where people can earn a living in those rural communities as part of this solar home system revolution and they have microfinancing models. I've spoken with bank managers there and they told me the repayment rate is nearly 100%. But it's a combination of local bank managers who are initially scared because these people have no assets, some of them, or have no track record with the bank. And uh, to still give them a loan, some of the companies that sell the solar home systems are actually managing the collection of the money or supporting the collection of the money and even given, giving a guarantee to the banks that if there's a problem, they will take back the solar home system and they repay the loan. So there are some innovating financing mechanisms that when I spoke with banks here, there seemed to be no appetite for that or no belief that that can work uh, and that this, that this can only work uh, with the uh, people who have the money and who can buy Emma's house and who have a, a, a good asset and who have you know, a, a good income to be able to, to uh, go into a, a, a lending agreement. So I think that is where I see, beside the, the, the uh, incredibly great uh, concept that Emma has uh, applied, I think there is a whole new uh, gigantic market still waiting to be tapped into with efficient, small-scale, cost-effective solar home systems and innovative financing mechanisms with local support. And I think then the, a whole new revolution in the island and off-grid areas might happen in the Philippines. Yeah, there are, uh, we, we had a session earlier on off-grid and there, were, there are, I think, 300 we call spug areas, missionary electrification, small power utility group, which are mini grids that are not connected to the main grid here in the Philippines. And then there's many others that, uh, well, I won't say many others, I think, I think he said they probably have, 90% of the people in the Philippines have access to electricity, but there are 300 of these mini grids uh, that could uh, be be serviced with renewable energy or something else, but uh, much we think much cheaper than the old diesels that they have right now. Actually, I wanted to ask Dion, how much does it cost you to connect a house to the grid? What what is the the, the price? Um, the price is nothing; it's just a service drop. So mm. the grid is there. Mm. Um, you're talking about the established grid; it's already there. So it's just a service drop. It's yeah. minor. So it's very small. I don't know, Bill, before you move on, that issue around the, the spuds, um, the current diesel charge and average for the current prices in the market is around 14 pesos per kilowatt hour, which is what the island grids are paying. Solar is coming in. Solar storage is coming in at 16. So they're becoming quite competitive. Um, right yeah, I was, I was just at uh, one, one spug area and talking with them. They got brand new 6 megawatts of diesel. And uh, so they're, they're efficient diesel. Uh, and the diesel price is lower than it has been forever. You know, tw with oil at twenty-five dollars a barrel, asking how much are you paying for your electricity? He said sixteen pesos. I said, no, wait a minute. Today, with the, with the oil prices as low as they've ever been, you're paying sixteen pesos. Yeah. And I said, well, <laughs> we, could, we I think we could do a lot better than that. But uh, Dion, we were talking earlier, and you said, yeah, I'd like to offer a renewable energy, a, a solar solution, but you've got to make it worth my while. I've got to be able to make money. I've got to have a, I've got to have a business model that makes sense. Um, so. If you just look at the Philippines industry or the growth as a whole, um, solar is here and it's going to be exponential. It certainly is going to grow. Um, you can see it despite the issues of affordability, despite the issues of justify, justifying um, in any way payback period. And I, I like the model that Emma showed in terms of um, building it into a mortgage because it's a long-term thing that people don't even notice. You pay your house and the solar panel comes with it. That's great. That's really a nice innovative solution. Um, the DUs at the moment are not really working too hard because the issue is not really hit them yet. But they need to know it's going to hit them. 
And those good DUs will be working on solutions to look at how they can integrate it into their service they're giving into the community because it will reduce the income of the DU, no doubt. So, um, despite the figures I showed you earlier of the DUs growing wonderfully, so they don't, they don't think it's an issue, it will over five to ten years start diminishing. Um, but as already in places like Australia, and they say it's because of PV. So, yeah, I think, I think in your comments that we, we, we shared before the conference here, you said, yeah, we need to figure out how we can all work together, all the stakeholders work together to make this uh, beneficial for, all, for everybody. But, but actually, if I look at the cost that Emma was quoting, the five uh, pesos per kilowatt hour, I mean, there is no need anymore to go to a DU. Uh, if you build that into the uh, whole concept of your home, uh, and you look at it as your long-term investment, then you know exactly what your kilowatt hour is going to cost you. Uh, why would you not want to do it? So in the future, uh, I think the DUs have to be uh, ready at that level to potentially even become obsolete. Because, uh, you know, why would we need them from the perspective of we can power our homes ourselves? Well, that's... Uh Let's get some comments from the from the, the audience here. Uh, with solar solutions providers, and that way you wouldn't be a threat. We wouldn't be a threat. We can actually partner because you have the existing customer portfolio, and we don't. And you can act. I mean, we can be together in reaching out to this type of market. And we welcome that kind of partnership. Um, we, that's most, something most, that we most can. The, most of the dealers would welcome that kind of partnership because they should know it's coming. And they yes. need to find a partner. Uh, My issue is finding a very good partner. Uh, at, yes. at good cost. Uh, that's why we're here talking. <laughs> we're saying that's an opportunity for collaboration. Okay. Yeah, I think the, uh, the World Bank has announced they have two new programs that they're introducing for the Philippines. Uh, one is for off-grid solar for individual houses, uh, and the other one is uh, for uh, on-grid uh, solar. I think the details will be coming out pretty soon. Uh, we had one conference. I don't, I don't think I know them well enough to be able to explain how it's all going to work, but there will be grants that will promote uh, solar for uh, areas that don't have, don't have the solar power right now. But, but uh, Celine, you're, you're a good point. I mean, how can we work together? The, like I said, the, the old way of delivering the service to the, to the customer, now, now maybe there's a, there's a second way to do it. And uh, maybe that's, that's something that the DUs can do. Deliver, it, deliver the same service, but deliver it a different way. Any other comments from the... Tell us who you are. Yes, uh, my name is Jesse Toldo from International Power Station. It's actually a question for Ms. Emma. Uh, if, uh, if we were in South Africa, Mr. James can verify this, <laughs> what you would see is a local housing project powered by uh, you know, rooftop solar, but they also have, in addition, the solar water heater. Have you thought about this? Because I think even with warm climates, people still would like to use hot water, especially in the morning? Uh, we did not include the water heater for the low-cost housing because uh, historically they don't use it for the low-income market. But we have um, our, our model can have the heating and the air conditioning separate from what we offer to the buyer. So the 1.1 kilowatt with lithium battery can only uh, service, the refrigerator, five LED lights. I can memorize it, you know. And two, two battery chargers, and the computer, and 19-inch television. Iron during the peak time of the day, and the rice cooker during the peak time of the day. And during the night time, it can really accommodate everything except for the heater in the air conditioning. If they want to add, which uh, is kind of rare for low income, to have air conditioning and heaters. They, they want to add, there is a, uh, a separate connection that allows them to go to directly to the grid. 
Uh, my name is Melvin. I'm with Clean Tech. So, uh, normally, normally for residential and probably for some of the commercial, the main hurdle rate would be the cash out for setting up the solar system, right? Um, so you have two options there actually. Either you do a PPA arrangement uh, where you buy, you you have it set up with your system, paying the per kilowatt rate uh, on a long term basis. Uh, but the problem there you'll be you'll have the problem with the with the DU uh, questioning your your contract. Um, the other way of doing it is doing a disagreement, a equipment disagreement. But the other problem there is given the high interest rate, um, you will turn it will turn out you're gonna be paying more on a monthly basis or until such time that you're able to finish the entire uh, lease of the term of the contract of the mortgage, right? So what are your thoughts there? How do we go around it? What's the best solution for that one? I can answer a little bit of that. Um, for the socialized housing component of our company, the regulations of the government does not really encourage um, a socialized, together with a 500 watt solar solution. But I was, I was able to convince uh, the chairman of Infinity to um, to try the lease for the socialized, and and then uh, later on we can do an SPV on that. So for the Via Verde, we offer two models. For the socialized housing, we offer a lease for 20 years, and then for the for the one with battery, which is higher than the 500 watts, we offer a direct uh, sale to. Um, to Pagibi Fund or the other bank. So I think to answer that question, um, we are just waiting for banks to come in and see the potential of a lease, uh, lease program for a mass housing project because it's really doable. If you go on a 5,000 to 10,000 homes, um, the, I think the expected IRR is very, very good for, for those who want to come in on lease except that the banks still has to uh, be enticed to, to join the, this thing, but may, maybe pretty soon, maybe Abbott can, can answer that. Are the, the banks, uh, are the banks um, have this appetite already for the lease? No. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> well, I, I have another idea. You know, right now the distribution utilities, they go out and they buy their generation and they pay a capacity payment for the with the capital cost making an energy better. So maybe another way to buy their generation is to buy this equipment which they install and own and put it on the consumer's roof and they get paid monthly over a period of time. But once again, like Dion said, it's got to make sense. You got to get a good return on your capital. All the buttons. So I think you and Emma should talk, or you and Celine. You and Celine should talk and see yeah, where, that, where that can go. And I would like to make an, an additional point as well. Um, one of the things that surprised the world a little bit after COP21 was that even though the Philippines played a major role in getting a very good supportive agreement, taking consideration of the fact that the Philippines is one of the main countries suffering from climate change, especially the rural people, it came as a surprise to the world that a lot of uh, coal-fired power plants were signed off immediately after that. What I've seen as well, what is happening is that there is a huge wave of protest on the ground against coal-fired power plants. So there's a considerable risk for the DUs involved in the whole coal strategy. The other risk that I would like to point out is at the moment prices are low. When I was at the Terrapin event uh, last month in Indonesia, one gentleman there said that the Indonesian <coughs> coal industry had already said at the current coal prices, they could only um, actually use 20 or 30 percent of their existing reserves because they're not going to make money mining more, hence they will have to raise prices significantly, otherwise them selling coal to coal-fired power plants ain't commercially viable anymore. I think this is another price risk. The beauty about a solar home system is 
once you've got your financing established, you know exactly reliably, without any risk of price or fluctuation, what your cost per kilowatt hour is. Once we then connect a lot of solar home systems to a grid with maybe even a central uh, industrial consumer who needs peak electricity that might at that time when those batteries are full not be needed anymore, then we uh, actually utilize our existing power generation even more. We generate additional revenue. I think a lot of the electronic payment systems that I've as well seen in Bangladesh, even in small poor communities, they will revolutionize the market. I think the Meralco gentleman this morning in his presentation was already indicating that there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in the next 10 years that will completely change how we use solar home systems as part of our overall electricity supply. The beauty is we know exactly the cost per kilowatt hour and I think uh, it's the game that will actually be the future as well for the Philippines. Then coming from a utility point of view, um, this is still a traditional utility business um, that we participate in. And we buy our power over 20 to 25 years. So it needs to be understanding, we can't react quickly. What we can do is, I guess on the expansion side, so the increases can be looked at. So advice to any DU right now is make sure you minimize your long-term contracts. So you leave room for expansion in terms of any future DG distributed generation that, 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 that will happen. Uh, just a comment on the prices, Matthias. Um, I was hoping when oil breached $100 per barrel that it caused people to use less vehicles and the coal prices would also stabilize. And when it came down, coal came down because of the fracking industry in the US. So that basically influenced the whole of energy prices throughout the world. And it's staying low. That's my worry. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, even they're talking in Emirates as well about increasing the oil price because it's just artificially too low. But it's still staying low. So it would be commercially crazy to go into something that's going to be risky right now in terms of any pricing issue in the future. Okay, any other uh, comments or questions from the audience? Okay, I think, uh, well, we'll just uh, we'll wrap it up then. I think we're right on time. Dion, thank you very much. Matthias, Emma, thank you all for your time.